speakers who I know are going to cover some really relevant, important and informative information. So we've got Sham Murad, who's a Masters in Law graduate and co-founder of Ayers for Activism, a community hub and revolutionary book club. We've got Helen Femi Williams. Helen Femi is a political commentator and founder of Let's Get Litical, a platform that looks to break down complex and often underreported topics. And we've got Annie Olaluku Tariba. Annie's a writer and independent researcher based in London. So just to kind of kick off this, I uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of a summary of what we are going to discuss today. So as I think it was mentioned in the promo that was sent out for this event, um, all issues in the world are intersecting. As Audrey Lord said, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't live single issue lives. So today we'll be talking about what the arms trade has to do with intersecting issues from policing to borders, from migration to climate justice. And we'll be demonstrating the need to connect the dots throughout them. So just a little run through of the agenda so you know what's coming up today. Each of our three speakers are gonna talk for 10 minutes. Um, we'll then have 25 minutes of discussion, which I will facilitate. And after that, we'll have a 25 minute Q&A session. Um, so please do submit your questions for the speakers and um, via the Q&A box um, in preparation for that session. And then we'll just finish with a closing kind of statements and a bit of a wrap up. Right, so I think that's enough to begin with. So I think let's crack on with our first speaker. So our first speaker is Sham Murad. Sham's a Baghdad born, Birmingham based Masters in Law graduate. She's the co-founder of Ayers for Activism, a book club which serves as a community hub for political education, solidarity, love, raising class consciousness and hosting mutual aid programs. So Sham, I'm just gonna hand over to you to go through your talk now. Thank you for the introduction. Um, before I start speaking more, well, before I start to divulge more into the arms trade, I think first of all, it's really important to highlight that today actually marks the 18 year anniversary of the US and UK occupation of Iraq, right? A war that saw over a million civilians dead many more refugees created and a political vacuum that led to the existence of ISIS and all the irreparable violence that they inflicted on the Iraqi people. And almost everyone on every side had lost from the war, right? But there's only one side that had won and that's the neoliberals and the arms dealers. The arms trade packages itself as something that is supposed to bring safety and security when in all actuality, it's probably the most dangerous and illeg illegitimate trade to ever exist. And Andrew Feinstein says it best, right? The author of Shadow World. He says from all our technological advances, the rise of terrorism and global crime and seeing state-sponsored violence and socioeconomic inequality continuing to rise, instability um, to the most alarming levels, right? We are somehow not any safer, and this is by no surprise. The arms trade is an institution which is not regulated. It is not legitimately financed. It's never been policed. It's never been transparent in its dealings. And of course, it's never been, been brought to accountability for all its crimes that it has committed, right? And yet somehow we're supposed to believe that, or be fooled that this is for our safety. It's the same old tired neoliberal story, right? Misery and death for the millions and profit and welfare for the few. And what's the result of this? What is the result of, I suppose, decades of these illicit gray area dealings? And first and foremost, it corrupts our democracies. It weakens already fragile states. It undermines the national security it claims to protect and it literally ignores better economic alternatives. So whilst I was doing the research for this panel, I saw that the newest data from the UK defense and security exports showed that whilst the US dominates the global market for defense exports and the arms trade um, with an estimated 47% of the market share last year, the UK came in second um, with a 16% share. And 
I suppose what's interesting is that the UK likes to pretend that their customers are benevolent or noble, or they're really unaware of the crimes that they may commit, etc. But when we really look at who the UK sells its arms to, we can see that they do it to some of the most deadly, deadliest occupiers in the world. The UK is one of the, um, the US is one of the UK's customers. And how does the US use the arms that the UK sells? For its racist policing and to lock up undocumented migrants through its ICE task force for severe human rights abuses, right? Last year in June, we saw the astonishing Black Lives Matter protests, protests that took place all over the world. We saw everyone join together and stand against police brutality, demanding either a complete abolition or the defunding of the police and just for it to stop, right? And how did the US respond to this? How did the government respond? By shooting the same rubber bullets and throwing the same CS gas that the UK has provided and sold. And that, that doesn't even really go into detail of the weapons that the UK provides the US that the US then uses internationally as it attacks them, right? Alongside with the US, the UK also sells arms to Brazil. And it's no secret that President Bolsonaro is a horrendous, horrendous homophobe, a horrendous sexist, is a downright a fascist, and uses these arms to repress and quell indigenous protests, right? As he tears down more indigenous homeland in Brazil. The UK also sells its arms to Israel. And in spite of the fact that we know, and the world and the international courts know, it legally occupies Palestinian lands and it treats them as second class, if we can call it that even, citizens. Um, and the UK continues to provide these weapons, right? And of course, most um, recently we see the UK continuing to defend its sale of arms to Saudi Arabia. And we've seen how Saudi Arabia uses these arms for its repression in its own country, for its repression in, uh, on the citizens of Bahrain, and of course, Yemen. So right now in Yemen right now, there is a staggering 20 million people facing famine horrific breakouts of cholera, typhoid, and of course, coronavirus is even coming into play. And despite what should really cause an international outcry to help the people of Yemen, Saudi Arabia has responded with airstrikes that has purposely targeted Yemen's agricultural sector, its sewage system, its civilian boats, and its medical facilities, despite the fact that Saudi Arabia knows and is aware of the coordinates for these medical facilities. So any chance that a developing nation has had to tackle um, coronavirus, and we've seen countries all over the world struggle, right? Yemen is already at a disadvantage because how can it fight coronavirus as it's being um, bombed to the ground by Saudi Arabia? So make no mistake that the UK plays an implicit, direct and umbilical part to what the Saudi Arabia does to Yemen. So any crime that Saudi Arabia commits then sold of the UK, we have BAE systems manufacturing Typhoon fighter jets for Saudi Arabia here in Wharton. We have MBDA manufacturing tank missiles for Saudi Arabia in Hertfordshire. We have Raytheon manufacturing guided bombs that Amnesty International has proven was used in an attack to, in a ceramics factory. And in spite of that, in spite of the proof that we have seen, the UK government um, has not only tried to stop selling arms, but instead has fought to campaign against arms trade and the judicial system to in fact sell more and accelerate the sale of more arms. And it's as if there's this sense of urgency to make more profits more quicker. And of course, at the expense of the deaths of more Yemenis. I previously mentioned in one of my previous talks with Kat that the Human Rights Watch had a document reported in um, and written in 2016. And it details um, previously documented airstrikes on civilian economic structures. So there was clear evidence that these weapons are killing innocent civilians that have been manufactured here. The report discussed how these airstrikes used um, were against factories, warehouses, two power stations, a farm. It killed 130 civilians, injured 170 more. The facilities hit by the airstrikes um, really importantly produced, stored, and distributed the goods for the civilian population, including food and medicine. And now we're here at an impasse and we're seeing so many people face famine as a result of it. And these attacks were 
targeting um, sectors of the nation that was quintessential for its survival. And that Raytheon paveway guide, the bombs, as I mentioned earlier, is built and manufactured here in Harlow. And not only that, but there's further admissions of guilt um, written in government documents, um, written evidence by the Foreign and Commonwealth Sec um, Office about the shadow missiles used in Yemen, et cetera. The list goes on, right? Um, the same document also goes on to speak about how the UK and the um, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia enjoys a deep and long-standing history of friendship and cooperation. And we know what the friendship and cooperation looks like. It looks like repression. It looks like death. It looks like um, targeted attacks for the many. So one of the ways Britain has formally tried to sanitize its role in Yemen, like, oh, but look, we're also the good guys, is by, I guess, claiming that they have committed aid to giving aid to Yemen. And I've previously talked, um, spoken about how this is a complete farce, right? But now, on top of the weapons that they sell to Saudi Arabia, they've also decided to cut the same aid to Yemen. So on top of the violence that they inflict, they're not even trying to do anything or try to pretend that they're trying to alleviate any, any of it. Um, and to take a quick side note, what makes it all the more sinister, I suppose, is that the UK government fails to address the ways in which the arms trade has undermined economic or de developmental progress. Um, is because these nations are aware of the deadly impact that neoliberalism has had in Yemen for the past two decades. Um, and I'm sure everyone understands what neoliberalism is, but for those who don't, it's just the idea that governments should be as small as possible and businesses should be big as possible. So we've seen the effect of, effects of austerity in the UK because of neoliberalism. We've seen how deadly of an impact it's had in Iraq. We've seen what it did to the people of Chile um, and Salvador Allende. You know, the, it's, it's the deadly effects of uber capitalism, which is what neoliberalism is. And it's happening in Yemen. We've seen the policies that the IMF has combined with the former regime's um, complacency in its government that has caused 70% um, youth unemployment, 17% of people in Yemen are illiterate. Only 8% of its labor force right now has any kind of university de degree. So when you intertwine neoliberalism with war and to kind of draw it back to Iraq, because today is the anniversary of the occupation of Iraq, the 2003 one. I know whenever I say the occupation, everyone's like, which one? Because they bombed Iraq so many times at this point. Um, I'm referring to the 2003 one. So yes, it's the anniversary. And it's no secret that during that war that many pol politicians had um, gained exuberant amounts of wealth because of the politicians ties to these companies. So Dick Cheney's shares in Halliburton went through the roof because of the blueprint of the war. And we're seeing the same results in Yemen now and globally, right? These arms trade dealers are able to make these billions and billions and billions of pounds in trade at the expense of people's lives. Yes. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Sham. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, I think you covered loads of um, loads of ground there and also really, really set up the conversation really nicely, just as a re reminder of what, sorry, <laughs> my video wasn't on, just as a reminder of what the arms trade is and how interlinked it is with a lot of the other issues that we're going to kind of cover off um, today. So next up, we've got Hemi Fe Helen Femi Williams. Helen is a political commentator and founder of Let's Get Litical, a platform that looks to explain complex political issues that are sometimes forgotten or deliberately missed out <laughs> by the mainstream media through talk, social media and infographics. Helen's also the founder of Litical Consultancy, a business striving towards racial equality in and outside of the workplace with a real focus on intersectionality. She's also on the board of Shack Charity and a facilitator for TNN, a grief charity for young adults. So I'll just hand over to you now, Helen. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for my introduction. Um, let me know if I go too fast, too slow and stuff. Um, but yeah. OK, so my relationship to borders is deeply personal, but connected to communities and spaces. I think a lot of the time, if you're a citizen, 
and you're black and brown and you live in the no- in you live in the northern sort of hemisphere of the world you know that your citizenship is just it, it can be taken away in some sense like just look at the case of Shalima Begum for instance whether you kind of agree or disagree with kind of what happened the way her citizenship was taken away is something that has something to do with her color all of a sudden she's Bangladesh even though she has no citizenship there and and the way they've just kind of connected it is something we should all be scared of to be honest it's the kind of slippery slope of citizenship if you're black and brown um so my family come from Nigeria my grandparents came here in the 1950s coming out around a time when you know Britain was scared of this kind of growing spread of communism in kind of the southern hemisphere specifically in Africa and there was a lot of decolonization movement so they allowed a lot of students to come here thinking that the students would you know learn some stuff and kind of bring capitalism back to the kind of south of the world and my dad kind of came here in the sort of mass migration of um, the 1980s Um, so my family's history has always been intertwined with colonial borders and the artificial creation of Africa and specifically Nigeria and Sierra Leone. Um, So there's definitely a recognition that I've always had that without this kind of burgundy or now blue passport, um, my rights and citizenship can are kind of um, can be taken away or just thought that. And I felt it was very apparent when I lived abroad. So um, when I lived in Malaysia, for instance, the way I was treated compared to like my fellow white Brits was sort of like, oh, like you're British too. Like, and there was this kind of sense of having to justify that I am black, but also British. And then if I, for instance, hung out with um, like black Africans in Asia, there was a sort of sense of hostility of why are you here? What are these people here for? What do you want? Are you really a student? Um, And you see that with the way visas are kind of created within the world um, and our freedom that we have being from the north or having um, a British passport and how much freedom you have um, when you have a passport like that. So I guess it's the difference between being an expat or being an immigrant. Um, So just to emphasize, borders are a system of power and they go beyond the demarcation of arbitrary lines on territory, but symbolize a politics of imperialism and power is deeply embedded in forms of racism. So you kind of see that with a lot of the conversations when it comes to like different refugee crises, as though someone would cross the lines across the world and and leave where they kind of, you know, grew up just for the sake of it. They're refugees, (laughs) like they don't just, people don't leave their homeland for the sake of it. Um, So yeah, and I think when I kind of worked kind of with the UN, um, I used to work for the UNHCR and you've become very aware of this kind of sense of like, um, I don't know how arbitrary the whole system is really and how much borders are such an arbitrary thing we do and how much a passport or a visa all these types of things allow you to navigate or not allow you not to navigate life um, and when it comes to borders borders have always been something that we put on the global south so it's been a way of kind of um, exploiting the global south and saying you know these these people these black and brown people can go here um, can't go here, and but certain other people can. But um, in a post kind of 9-11 world, kind of what Shan talked about, we see actually this notion of borders being created or being more um, violent within the global, global North too. Um, so um, in a post 9-11 world, we have this kind of heightened sense of politics, the heightened politics of fear after the sort of terrorist attacks that have led to the kind of militarization of western borders too so it's always been something that we kind of have seen in the global south but actually we see that same sort of movement and lack of movement are not allowing people to move based on this idea of politics of fear and now we also see it in the kind of conversations we see in climate change too and i'll touch on that if there's time but you see it with like right wing the right wing rhetoric um taken up taking the climate change movement as a way to kind of stop people um, from moving places with the conversations around population growth. But these conversations are only really about people moving around in the global south or people from the global south trying to come to the global north. So just to emphasize, borders are violent. Um, and the kind of violence we see at borders are assistance of violence itself. 
So when we think of borders or a lot of the borders where we see a lot of violence, like for instance in America with families in cages or you know the many people who died in um, a, along the Mediterranean coming from you know North Africa to um, Europe, we know that these deaths are actually preventable. There's absolutely no need for the kind of deaths and the kind of tragic ways we've seen people die. But they are the system, they are a um, they are a symptom of the notion of borders themselves. And we see them even when we think of like the borders that were created in a post-colonial world, India becoming this kind of imperial pa a power for, for South Asia, and the fact that since the since kind of um, the um, since the since the creation of India itself, that border has always been a hostile place and the occupation of Kashmir. Um, so you know, it's just the idea that we wouldn't necessarily we wouldn't have illegal immigration if we didn't have laws around this, because there's nothing inherently wrong with wanting to move around the globe. And like I said, it's the idea of you know what is an expat and what is an immigrant and what makes you that different. Um, so, you know, I advocate and I truly believe in this kind of notion of like the freedom to stay, the freedom to move and the freedom to return. Um, and it's a book I read from Hasha Walia and a lot of people kind of talk about this. So the freedom to stay is about actively fighting against the things that displace people, war, poverty, capitalism, state violence, these types of things. The freedom to move is obviously talking about well if you know stuff is happening let people move around let people be able to kind of save themselves don't leave them to just die if there's state violence happening if there's wars happening if there's famine happening and the freedom ret return is about creating an environment where people can return and people can live where they want to go because like we said people only move if they need to if they have to um, people aren't just moving for the sake of it there's always this notion of like all these economic migrants trying to move places well they wouldn't they wouldn't need to move if they didn't have to. Um, so yeah, the aftermath of terrorism, uh, terrorism, we've seen the sort of militarization of borders seep into the kind of domestic sphere that we only thought would be in the global south. We've seen it with Trump and BLM, and we're seeing it now in the UK with even the powers that are created with this new crime bill. Um, the US went around the world kind of perfecting the domestic, the, their domestic militarization, you know, with the occupation of the Philippines, Hawaii, and the UK did it for hundreds of years through empire building. But the same way we see kind of police and prisons, and they always have these places in our mind, is the same way we see borders. It's the thing we, we can't see without, we can't think of a world without polices, prisons, and borders. But all these concepts are racist, they are anti-Black, and they're structures that don't like serve anyone. So it was only the other day that I kind of found out that the word mobility derives from the word mob. And mob is used as a word to mainly describe poor young men. So prisons and borders fundamentally share the same idea of criminalizing mobs. Imperialism being about, imperialism being about a way to colonize and violate countries um, that they can occupy. Um, so we never really talk about borders when we're talking about people going on holiday, but we need to remind ourselves that the state itself is illegal, but the people moving around it never has been. And if I can, I know I'm kind of running out of time, I'll just quickly try and touch on the sort of climate change, climate change point. Um, but in the past couple of years, climate change, the climate change movement and the displacement of, pe of people has kind of... Um, Outplay, outpaced itself when it comes to um, being a, displacing people. Um, but climate disasters are very much informed and intertwined with the politics of imperialism, racism, um, um, power and legacy. Just think of, for instance, uh, coastal countries like Bangladesh and the over extraction, oh, <laughs> the over extraction and industrial forms of um, development with sweatshops that essentially have created the epicenter of creating kind of toxic pollution across the world. Um, and really and truly, I guess my main point here is within the climate change conversation, we have to remember, I put time on for myself, within the climate change conversation, we have to remember 
that um, not to kind of have this growing mantra of kind of eco-fascism and green nationalism because they justify this notion of white supremacy. And actually we, um, whether you are from the North or the South, um, when it comes to kind of the climate change movement, we're all kind of um, responsible. And I'll just leave it there, but yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Helen. That was fantastic. I love the way you really connected um, those issues from your own experience um, and also looking at how they're impacting not just here in the UK, but globally. Um, so we're going to go on to our final speaker now. Um, so our next speaker is Annie Ololoku Tariba. Annie is a writer and independent researcher based in London. Um, she focuses on a variety of intersecting issues such as race, class and justice campaigning and particularly looks at um, thinking and writing about the theory and history of blackness. So Annie, if I just pass over to you. Thank you. Um, okay, I hope this is going to be coherent because I have quite a few things that I want to touch on. Um, so we're living in a world where many ask us not to compare struggles. Uh, we're told that um, some forms of struggle are beyond compare, in particular when it comes to the question of violence. But what we should know is that the technologies and the corporations which purvey violence are global, and they've always been. So I'll start with an example. In October, there was an uh, uprising in Nigeria, which spread throughout the country, started in Lagos, and it was centered on this police unit called uh, SARS. So the campaign was NSARS, many of you may have heard of it. What became apparent, despite the fact that the initial response from some in the UK was to call on the UK government to impose sanctions, um, what we found out was actually that the SARS unit had been provided with not just equipment, but also training from the UK between 2016 and 2020. And so what that should kind of give us pause for thought about is the fact that a lot of the time when we don't see it, the kinds of violences that we're seeing in the global south, particularly in relation to the ways that states repress people, are being sponsored and also facilitated by the governments that we turn to as the moral arbiters. I think another example of that was after the Arab Spring in 2012, when David Cameron um, sought, to, uh, prom um, sought to promote the arms trade um, or British arms companies, um, in particular BAE systems in the Middle East. And what we kind of see continuously is this contradiction between the presentation of the West on the global stage as the people who protect democracy and the people who protect kind of morality versus the reality of their actions, which is as a facilitator and often sponsor of forms of violence in the global south. So I want to kind of draw this into um, conversation with the violence of border regimes, and I'm going to use this um, stretch this example of Nigeria. Um, one thing that we do know for uh, I'll start with the example. So in, two, in April 2005, the U British government imposed a ban on entry visas for young Nigerians aged between 18 and 30 who intended to visit the UK for the first time. At the same time, ethnicity data gathering distinguished the category of Black Nigerian from the category of Black African. And what we saw in the aftermath of that was a reorganization of the UK's embassies in Nigeria such that the UK funded and sponsored the um, expansion of biometric data gathering um, and scanners in Nigeria. And this is a clear example of how the British state seemingly innocuously has provided the very same technologies for surveillance um, and di um, disciplining um, that, it, uh, that it claims to be preventing. And what we, off um, what we find in this is that very often when we kind of talk about the, well, the things that we get pulled to defending things like the AIDS budget, et cetera, a lot of this ends up going into the provision of arms and the um, provision of quote unquote security. And this is all happening against the backdrop of a continual global crisis in which anxieties around global terror have been leveraged by elites in the global south as a means to access the financial and military support from the west to prop up their regimes. And that's in turn used to quell political dissent. And within this framework, what's happening is we're seeing violence exported, not just physically, but also discursively into the global south. For example, we continue to talk about 
um, state violence in the language of defense as if the imperialist Western state and their gatekeeper states in the global South aren't the chief purveyors of violence around the world. But what we're also seeing is the, di um, the displacing of political questions um, uh, through, the lang or through languages and doctrines of security and cultural essentialism. So for example, in Nigeria, we see ecological crisis caused by, for example, um, uh, oil um, extraction in the, Delta, in the Niger Delta region. We see um, e ecological disaster caused by the disappearance of Lake Chad in the North, but then that peers back to us as the language of security through the kind of vectors of Boko Haram in the North and um, Niger Delta kidnappings in um, the Niger Delta. And so where we are offered new solutions or where there's a possibility of finding new solutions um, to prevent um, environmental degradation, to prevent um, political, um, to vet, prevent political repression, the language of it um, reconstitutes itself as security and cultural essentialism in order to prevent us from being able to see those solutions. And so what we come to here is a recognition that the demand to end the arms trade must also then be a demand for abolition. So we connect the dots, for example, through NSARS between the, uh, the brutality of policing, not just in the global north, but also in the global south. Um, and the, um, the way in which those violences are tied back to the imperialist state. Um, and so then we see a demand for abolition, not just of the prison, but we have to be connecting that demand of the abolition of prisons also to the broader demand of the abolition of borders. And we know in the UK that a significant number of people who've died after contact with the state have died um, as a consequence of contact with border agents. We also know that even in the pandemic, the UK government has remained resolute in the notion that it wants to kind of send people off in charter fights um, through deportations. And this also requires an abolition of empire and all the other kind of repressive functions of states, which um, are the imperative that drive the proliferation of violence globally. And what I want to kind of spend the last few minutes talking about um, is the fact that there is a tradition which saw this, and it was an internationalist history um, of anti-colonial um, of anti-colonial struggle, which connected the dots between the violence that we were experiencing domestically and the violence that was being wreaked globally. And what that tells us is that the issues that we're dealing with aren't just intersecting, they're actually interdependent struggles um, and interdependent um, structures. So for example, let's go back to the, um, what I started with in terms of Nigeria. What we know is that Nigeria makes more money um, from remittances sent back by people that it's sent abroad um, than it does from the oil trade. Um, and that's been the case for the last few years. And so what we're seeing is the, de um, the degradation of conditions in the global south in order to force people into the global north in order to plug labor gaps. Um, and so where we kind of think of these as issues which join at a point which produce um, uh, some kind of synergy at, at certain points what we have to understand is that these are all um, interdependent and by inter interdependent I mean that if one thing um, in order to achieve or attain um, the demands that we have in terms of ending the arms trade we have to um, attain the demands um, that we have as it, as it pertains to abolition specifically um, preventing or ending the justifications that are given for the, um, the continued proliferation of weapons. And so I kind of want to end, I think I have about two minutes left, um, by saying this. As I mentioned off the top, we're living in a time when we're told consistently not to compare struggles um, between peoples, and we're told to show up for each other as allies, as opposed to as people in a united global struggle. That's completely out of step with the history that has taught us that we have the power to change the world. And I think that's a kind of result of a sense of despair or a sense that things are too much for us to overcome. And what I wanna inject in the last minute is to remind people that the unity that we have, the possibility of unity that we have is not simply one of sympathy with each other or even of empathy. It's through a recognition that when we're fighting for each other, when we're fighting to emancipate each of us from the violent structures of global imperialism, we're fighting for ourselves as well.
what happens to the young boy who's um, brutalized by, an, uh, by a SARS cop in Nigeria is deeply and inex inextricably ties to what happens to me in terms of how I experience my blackness in the UK and my interactions with the state. And I kind of want us to hold that as we go into the conversation, I'll end there. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, that was absolutely brilliant. I think all three of you covered a wealth of different topics there and really started to demonstrate, as you said, not just the intersectionality, but the really the interdependence of all of these um, issues with each other. So next we're gonna go into um, a discussion and really a follow on to pick into some of the elements that all three of the speakers discussed in their separate talks. Um, so I think Annie summed up really well um, there in the discussion and um, how people often tell us not to connect to these struggles. We're constantly told not to compare one issue with another, when in reality, we know that these things, as she said, are not just intersectional, but are deeply independent on each other. So I want to just start by kind of picking into that notion a little bit more in relation to some of the topics that all three of the speakers um, picked up. If we think about um, the politics of the UK in the last 10 years and the journey that we've been on from the Tories coming into government at the beginning, um, just after the, the beginning of the decade, just after the um, financial crash, and we then had 10 years of austerity um, to follow. And we know the damaging impact that that has had particularly when we've seen it um, the setup that it's meant and that we just haven't been able to deal with this pandemic in the way that we should be. Our NHS hasn't been staffed well enough. We know that the, cap, the cuts to public services have had a massive impact. Um, so I wanna look a little bit about um, how governments and how society talk about these issues across the world and how we're constantly told not to compare struggles. We think about um, the narrative that Jeremy Corbyn created as leader of the Labour Party when he took the party to a decidedly anti-war stance for the first time in many years, uh, reflecting on the fact that the, the, lead, the, the leader before that, you know, has, um, well, a couple before that, has the Iraq war um, and other, you know, terrible issues like connected to war um, on his record. So that was a big departure for the Labour Party at the time. But a lot of the public at the time said, um, why is Jeremy Corbyn talking about war when he came into government? We weren't currently, you know, technically in a war, although we still know that we have troops stationed in many places across the world and the role of the arms trade and the UK being a, a major, major um, player in the arms trade globally means that even if we may not be actively technically in a war right now, we are fueling wars continuously and have been for years. But people said, oh, Jeremy Corbyn, why are you talking about war? That's not important. You know, the NHS is struggling. And I think what's really, really important is that we, we need to constantly make the argument that the domestic policies that we, we have in the UK here are completely interconnected and indeed interdependent on the international policies around the world. So I want to pick into that a little bit. Um, we've seen over the pandemic, there's been a lot of talk about a migrant crisis. As soon as the, um, the numbers of de COVID deaths started going up at the beginning of last year, on all of the tabloid um, broadsheets, we had migrant crisis, influx of migrants printed everywhere. So I wanna kind of go into a little bit around the connectivity between us sending millions of arms across the world to fuel wars um, and then migrants coming over to the UK. As Gary Young said, those in the West who insist we cannot take in the world's misery must at the very least acknowledge how much of that misery we are responsible for. This is not a question of guilt, but responsibility. Many need to come here precisely because we insisted on going there. So um, I guess to all of the speakers, but if we start with Sham, can you talk a little bit about that in interconnectivity between us and our central role in the arms trade and the arguments that we're having about migration and borders? Yes, of course. I mean, I speak as a refugee, of course. I was born and raised in Iraq. And the only reason I had to leave Iraq was because of the 
um, irreparable damage that the UK and the US caused during the war. And, you know, as a result, I, of course, just, I can hear my nephew screaming outside. And as a result, of course, I came to this country and I saw the hostile environment that was created for us. And, you know, during the 2000s, it wasn't as bad as we see it now, but I mean, it's just the role of capitalism, you know, it creates a policy of colonial weight of the monopolistic possession over all territories of the world and over all people of the world. We see it in Iraq, we see it in Yemen. I mean, we saw it in Syria and the response to the migrant crisis there. The UK refused to take many people. Um, the countries surrounding Syria refused to take them in. We saw hundreds of thousands of people freezing to death in tents because they weren't given um, any homes to go to. And, you know, when we think, you know, when we think about the capitalists and these people, right, um, GS4, Halliburton, all these neoliberals that have these, are able to gain these exuberant amounts of wealth on the backs of our depression, our suffering, our hunger, et cetera. It's no secret that, you know, the right wing, the fascists, these greedy capitalists are able to intersect what they need, essentially. Understand that by working together, they can make more profits, et cetera. You know, the weapons that the arms trade sells um, and bombs the country to smithereens, then, you know, Companies like Halliburton and other neolibs are able to gain billions of going into these countries and quickly privatizing the whole state and making wealth off of the backs of the countries, which then creates mass refugees and migrants which have to escape these countries to look for a better life. And of course, we then see GS4 making, um, making profits by incarcerating these same migrants and refugees, we see it in Yarswood, we see it with what ICE does, et cetera. And then of course people die. So it's this cycle of suffering and repression and these things that they're able to intersect and weave and understand how to work together. So as Anne rightly pointed out, we have to find the ways that all our oppressions, however different we, it may look to one another, how they intersect, how they weave together how they work together. The same um, Britain that trades in arms that kills um, Yemenis in Saudi Arabia is the same Britain that trades in its arms that kills protesters in Nigeria and innocent people in Nigeria via their SARS um, task team. Yeah, brilliant. Totally agree with kind of everything you you touched on there. And you kind of started touching on a little bit around how um, how migrants, how asylum seekers and refugees are being treated even right now. And yesterday was um, a kind of national day of action against the barracks that are currently, you know, have been set up during the pandemic where right now hundreds of asylum seekers and refugees are being, um, you know, forced to live in ex, ex army barracks and prisons in their hundreds. I want to talk a little bit about that um, and how that's an indication and um, a signifier really of the bigger issues at play. Um, so I want to just bring in Helen on that topic, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, I don't know, I, I kind of see like, especially when it comes to kind of the problems around, I guess, migrants as a whole, Within this conversation, I feel I feel kind of like it's twofold. It's like one in this country, in terms of how we learn and what we learn even in school, it's actually ridiculous how much we don't learn. So especially when it comes to history, I could tell you so much about you know the English Civil War and Henry VIII and how many wives he had, but we don't necessarily learn about Brit like the British Empire, not in anywhere the amount of detail we need to. So 
when it then comes to the conversation of like why are these people here why they're all these like refugees in the country or illegal immigrants whether they come from all of this the conversation needs to start from why would they even come here what is it about britain that means that all these people just keep coming here and i feel like because that's always lost within the conversation um people become quite desensitized to it so people don't even necessarily see them as people because they're just a bit like why are all these people coming here um helen is very funny um and then i feel like when it comes to kind of you know the conversation around borders anyway um when it comes to the conversation around like immigrants and refugees and all these types of things it kind of bothers me because we start to think about it in a very like darwinism way and um, the idea that the earth or like certain areas within the earth can only carry a certain amount of people and these conversations lead to the kind of ideas that you were talking about where people are staying in kind of inhumane situations because we're having this quite darwinistic view of the earth and humans and population growth and land. Um, so, I mean, I think the com I think within that, there's a level of education, which I've already touched about, but also there's a level that we need to be st start thinking about all the other different structures that uphold that. So it's not just the governments, it's corporations, it's people that profit off this idea that, you know, people can just live in this way to speak. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's my only two points. I'm going to see what's wrong with my audio and see if I can fix it. But uh, I can hear you okay. Maybe if you're finding Helen a bit quiet, maybe just turn up the volume on your uh, laptop or whatever device you're listening on. Um, but yeah, I totally agree, Helen. I think we need to constantly be making the human arguments uh, because the discussion around migration and stuff, well, we know as we've discussed that borders are a construct construct anyway right um but the conversation around um migrants etc often falls to this kind of what what are they contributing to our society we know that the policies under the guise of reforms as they always call it that the tories have put in which are you know just absolutely draconian um, crackdown on on people's rights and they're always gonna see migrants as like and we've seen it in this australian points based point system that they've launched they're saying what is a skilled worker what is an unskilled worker and rather than getting into the arguments and saying oh you know these people work for the NHS and therefore they do contribute to our society yes that's true and it's important but fundamentally people are human beings we're not all just numbers um, just to be totted up like how valuable we are and so yes it's important to you know make the economic arguments about migration and point out that migrants are really really productive in our society but much much more important than that is the human arguments and we need to be constantly not allowing ourselves to get pulled into this kind of how much is this person worth or can they come to this place or this thing because we know that these things are constructed they're de deeply rooted in racism and colonialism and imperialism and we need to fight against that um so just kind of going on from there I, I really kind of liked what you said around um it's an indication of uh, so how we're treating these people is an indication of broader issues at play um, I think it kind of relates to what Tony Benn said when he said that the, the way that a government treats refugees is very instructive because it tells you how they treat anyone if they could get away with it. And I think we're seeing that more and more. If we look at the last two weeks has obviously been um, a very intense period in the UK with several um, big stories that have kind of uh, taken up rightly a lot of media attention and and had a lot of people very angry particularly in regards to policing um, but if we look at the the situation with Sarah Everard and the um, vigil that was held and the reaction from the Metropolitan Police I think what we're seeing play out is that it's exactly what everyone has known the police are always like but suddenly people are thinking that it's worse because they're seeing someone like them um, being treated badly by the police. So I think this is linking back to what, what Tony Benn said in that it, the way that refugees are treated is just instructive of how they would treat, the government would treat anyone if they were to get away with it, which shows why we need to constantly be advocating for the most marginalised because no one is free whilst anyone is in chains. So if we look at policing and how that's changed during the pandemic, 
Um, I want to bring you in, Annie, on this. I know you were talking a lot about militarisation and police um, during your talk. If we look at how police have been able to increase their powers during the pandemic and really kind of seize this opportunity to increase surveillance, increase the authoritarian state. And more recently, we've seen with the police bill they're trying to put down, uh, put through stamping down on the right to protest. Um, can you come in a little bit about what what that says about the broader issues at play um, and how we we manage this, knowing that it seems to just be kind of increasing? Yeah, um, I just wanted to kind of say one thing just before I answer the question. Um, I kind of seen a lot of this. Um, I've seen a lot of people kind of saying, you know, uh, there was a speech going around sort of saying, where were you? And like, there's a, the, uh, a kind of line uh, which says that like a lot of people are only just kind of realizing it now that it affects them. And I kind of wanted to, um, push back a little in two ways. One, just by saying, you know, the protests that we saw last year around BLM were the most widespread, uh, I believe, since the Chartists, um, and they were multiracial. And I think that one thing that we learn is that struggle can change our perceptions of who's willing to fight for us and who's willing to fight with us. And the second thing that I would say is that um, we kind of know historically that it's not all white women who the police care about or claim to care about. You know, if you're working class, if you're a sex worker, your experience of the police state is very different regardless of your whiteness. And that kind of links in, I guess, hopefully, to what I was going to say in response to the question about policing. Um, there's, a, there's a narrative which sees this as a rise in authoritarianism rooted in the conservative government. But we kind of have to understand this as part and parcel of neoliberalism. Um, you know, before the Tories, we had ASBOs from a Labour government. Even if you think about the response to the Conservative um, uh, policing bill, um, the fact that the Labour front bench could only conjure up um, a, uh, an amendment which asked for more criminalization, which asked for the criminalization of misogyny as a specific hate crime. We have to understand that this is something which is a consensus issue um, in the upper echelons of government. And so the resistance to that can only come from the streets, the resistance to that can only come with a mass movement. And we've seen the impact and the power that, it, that, that mobilizations can have in terms of changing or shifting the course. But I'll just kind of contextualize that. Um, we're constantly in this cycle of, I guess, breaking news, which is produce, produces in us a, set, a sense of con consistently being in crisis. But the problem is that today crisis is no longer the exception, crisis is the rule. Um, and so um, the kind of powers which are afforded to police um, in order to be able to police to surveil people. I mean, my first arrest was when I was on a BLM demo back in 2015, um, a nonviolent protest for which we all got charged with violent disorder in order that they would be able to gather our biometric data. And so we kind of have to draw the dots between um, increasing surveillance, which seems innocuous and is framed to us as for our safety, and the increasing incursions on our civil liberty. Um, and then the kind of final thing that I wanted to say on that is that um, in terms of the way, you know, in the coming weeks, um, what we're going to be told is, you know, get off the streets. It's about your safety. It's about the pandemic. We have to remind ourselves that the reason that people are willing to still go out onto the streets is because the status quo is not neutral, no matter how much we think that it is. The reality is that there are other things in this world, these structures of imperialism, of colonization, of neoliberalism, which kill people on a daily basis with very little said on it. And so um, I think that we're in it for a long haul fight. Um, I'm deeply pessimistic about the Labour Party as a, a vehicle for opposition to this, this march through authoritarianism. But I think that that's why we require more education and protest literacy and more political education about what the issues at stake are. Yeah, totally agree with everything you said. Thank you, Annie. Um, and you mentioned there the, the significance of BLM last summer. I think we all felt it. It was, you know, during a, a time where everyone was confined into their house, we were in a kind of lockdown. Um, and we saw the brutal murder of George Floyd, not just George Floyd, but several other um, people before, Breonna Taylor, Trayvon Martin, etc. 
Um, and it was it was a, a really, really significant time during the year, year last year. And people rightly were very, very angry. And, and there was a big kind of uprising and, and a real resurgence of the, of the movement. I think then what we've seen since then has been a series of other events. Um, but I'm interested from the speakers around how we galvanize that energy from last summer. We know that there was a mix. There was people that had kind of realized suddenly overnight, I'm not sure where they've been for the rest of their life, but suddenly overnight that, um, you know, racism is a problem, that militarization is a problem, that the police aren't there just to help us all, like, like some people have thought. There was other people who it was, you know, this, none of these things were new issues and these were things that they've known their whole life and they've never had the option to be um, unaware of. But either way, there was this big mass movement that was built and I guess a generation of people that were brought into the idea of protest, the idea of standing up and saying no. How do we galvanize that? If we look at some issues that we've been talking about today around the arms trade, knowing that these are quite complicated issues, um, obviously in Andrew Feinstein's work, he talks about the fact that the arms trade is, is really for the preserves of a very small number of people. It's deliberately kept behind closed doors. It's hard to understand. How do we open up issues and topics like this to this new kind of generation of people that have become woken up to the issues in the world and maybe got involved in the protest last summer? And how do we bring them in to our movement? Um, can I bring you in, Sham, on that? Instagram and for graphics. I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, I think with this kind of stuff, I read a really interesting piece. I think it was about five years ago in 2017. And it was called the shock doctrine of the left. So for those who don't quite understand what the shock doctrine is, it's the, um, it's the shock therapy which the right wing use. It is, you know, taking times of really, really terrible human misery and capitalizing on that to privatize states. You know, we saw it in Iraq, their shock that they used was essentially bombing the country to the ground, completely annihilating it from um, top down to a point the state, um, the country had a blank slate, which it then moved forward in pushing its neoliberal agenda, right? We saw it happen in Chile, where they killed the democratically elected socialist leader, Salvador Allende, gathered people in football stadiums, shot them all en masse, et cetera. They used that, that um, fear of violence and repression as the shock. And then they used that as a blank slate to privatize the country. We saw it happen in New Orleans right after the Hurricane Katrina. Um, the, terrible repression that that caused, you know, although the shock was a natural disaster, what did the US government do as a response? Firstly, it didn't help any, anyone in Katrina, but they privatized the schools. They um, created these chartered schools that hasn't benefited any of the kids in New Orleans, right? So it's this idea of shock and awe, right? As soon as the shock happens, be it a natural disaster, a war, um, et cetera, then using that shock whilst people are at a dismay to implement these policies. And I think what the left really needs to do is galvanize on these opportunities, you know, because the right wing does it regardless. I think we need to spend less time um, thinking about how terrible these things are, but more time explaining why this is happening what is going on. As Annie said, we need that political education. We need that education re re um, regarding protesting, etc., to come about. And as soon as these things happen, we need to be on the ground. We need to be talking about it. We need to be explaining, etc. And using, I suppose, the shock doctrine of the left as a means to move forward. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I want to come to some questions that um, some of the attendees have been putting to the speakers. So Lisa said, 
can we abolish borders, prisons and police without abolishing nation states? And what do the panel feel are the most effective and creative ways to organize, to imagine, resist and transform, especially those with relative power and privilege? Um, so I don't know if anyone has any specific thoughts of that wants to come in on it. Helen, I can see you coming off mute. Yeah, let me know if this is better. I put in headphones. Um, and I'll try and I'll try and project. Um, I think that's a really good question. I think it's really complex. And I think my whole life, just like everyone else, we've lived in this this world. So to imagine a world without kind of prisons, polices, and the way that we see it, I think is just unfarcical. Um, but when it comes to this notion of nation states, um, especially for countries in the global south, or to be honest, any country that was colonized, there's not really any such thing as a nation state anyway. Oh, maybe not, <laughs> I'll project. Um, there's not really any such thing as a nation state anyway, because most of these kind of borders or these ideas of countries were created. They weren't something that people themselves came together. Like if there was nation states, things would be, um, most countries would be alongside tribes and cultures rather than alongside, oh, this is Nigeria, this is Ghana. Um, so in this type of term, to be honest with you, you, you can't really imagine this kind of idea of a nation state um, mixed responses. So yeah, that's all I really had to say on that subject. I don't know if anyone else. Can I jump in? Yeah, go for it. Okay, I didn't think I was gonna talk about Lenin in this. <laughs> um, but I think that one thing that Lenin offers us, um, and that's why he was so important to the tradition that I talked about, which was the anti-colonial tradition, is that we have to understand the world as a world system. And so when we think about these things, I don't think any of those things can be abolished without the abolition of the nation state as it exists. And actually the anti-colonial movements are often typecast as nationalist movements, but they didn't see that as an end goal. And um, they actually saw achieving national power towards the end of human emancipation. And that's why they saw their struggles as deeply interconnected. And so when we bring that into today, we kind of have to understand how national borders frame our thinking such that we become oblivious to or impervious to the domination and oppression of others. When we think about issues of race within national borders, we don't, for example, take account of the fact that everybody living in the UK who is able to access some kind of resource from the state is benefiting from extraction that's happening in the global south. And so we always have to be militant in terms of how we're imagining a future that we think beyond the nation's borders. And we also situate ourselves, we in the West, no matter what position you are in the West, are relatively privileged as compared to the worst off in the global South. And so we have to situate that and be careful not to kind of center ourselves in a way that um, prevents us from being able to do. I want a world in which nobody is oppressed as opposed to a world in which only I'm not oppressed, if that makes sense. Yeah, makes total sense and I, I completely agree with you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about climate justice because I think a couple of you touched a little bit um, in your separate talks about it and the interconnectivity between the climate crisis, which we know is, you know, our, the biggest issue of our time um, with some of the other connect, connecting issues that we've talked about around um, the arms trade, etc. And I want to kind of connect those two things together and, and get your guys thoughts on, um, you know, a lot of the proposals that have been put forward by some of the major governments in the world around this idea of a green industrial revolution that's really seeking to connect the kind of fundamental issues of inequality in our society, problems with job, problems with uh, infrastructure around uh, employment, et cetera, and connecting that with the, with the issue of the climate crisis. There was a question that came in that was kind of related to this from Ian. And he said that the, the arms trade is morally indefensible, but that's only half the story. The other half is providing alternative jobs for workers in arms factories with a just transition to jobs in renewables. What practical steps are CAP taking to, well, I'm not expecting you guys to, because you're not all speakers on behalf of CAP, but what practical steps do you think we can all take um, to develop general acceptability of this idea, the intersectionality between the arms trade and unemployment? Um, I want to bring um, Sham in on that. I don't know, Sham, I know you've talked before, I think I've seen you talk in events about like the Lucas plan and things like that. So maybe we could talk about that as a kind of, historical example and then how we can look to be kind of um, 
you know, insp inspired by that, but what does that look like uh, in the in the day to day? Um, I think, yeah, it's a good point. I think when people understand what I, firstly, we need to tackle the notion of, I suppose, what green jobs are, you know, they're not just um, wearing helmets and attaching solar panels on people's houses, as much of the fact that is a green job, etc. But you know, our nurses, our teachers, our, you know, caring institutions are just as much green jobs as anything else so I think first of all these are the sectors that need to be heavily funded and taken care of because they are the vehicle they are the instruments for our futures I think um I'm not as well versed on um climate justice as other people but for me you know my concerns are the fact that the global south has never been the biggest emitter of you know um the climate etc yet they're the ones that are going to face the heaviest consequences as a result you know Bangladesh faces complete extinction extinction and when you look at the again it's the neoliberals when you look at the companies who are able to make money off of the fossil fuels fuels um and they pummel millions into lobbying com companies that question and erode and corrupt our democracies to get their ways I think it's not enough to just ban plastic alone. Um, some of the reforms, I suppose, in these new deals are enough either. It, these companies need to be completely regulated and if not abolished, I actually call for the abolishment, but um, they need to be completely abolished, etc. because these small reforms really won't do much justice for our futures. And I suppose the idea of environmental socialism is what should be called out into play, where we stand behind these indigenous communities, um, where we support these caring institutions, such as teachers, such as nurses, etc. Yeah, definitely. Helen, do you want to come in on that as well? Because I know you, you talked quite a bit about climate justice in your um, speak. So maybe we could uh, speak, speak. I can't speak today. <laughs> I think I've been on too many Zoom calls this week. Um, so I want to talk about that um, linking between the, the climate crisis and the and, and the arms trade with how do we visionary, because I, I guess, as, as, as Sham said, we, we're quite good in our movement of like pointing out all of the issues in the world, which is, is great and it's important, but also how do we look at building a world that deconstructs all of those problems and, and create the vision for the, the future that we want to live in? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question, actually. And it, and it is, you're so right. I think we are we're really good at like saying all the things that are wrong. Um, and I think they're important and they're important, obviously, as a way to kind of address it. Um, I think that, yeah, like I kind of touched on it already, but it's like, you know, when it, you know, the military is the biggest consumer of like hydrocarbons and the biggest, one of the biggest for greenhouse um, contributors, uh, greenhouse gas contributors as well as sort of massive corporations um so sometimes when we think about like the, the 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 conversations around climate change you know we can all take less showers and we can all be more green but individuals within ourselves we're not going to solve climate change it's the massive corporations it's these things that are really polluting the world um the uk for a very long time has not been a country of manufacturing for a very long time now you know since the 80s the where the UK makes its money has shifted apart from arms trades arms trades is still something that the UK makes a lot of money for but other than that really and truly it has shifted we don't really have a big mining industry as we did before um which obviously meant that a lot of people lost their jobs and a lot of sort of post mining towns are still recovering a lot of them became sort of university kind of towns but a lot of them the suffering from that kind of mass unemployment is still there um so i think it's about kind of reimagining what we see as work and how we see work and i think that's a, actually kind of a wider conversation within itself but um things like uh things even when it comes to like four day weeks and 
um, this idea of like taking longer sabbaticals and these types of things. I know I'm kind of like going on a tangent, but I say this to say the way we even see work is so wrong right now. We, we see this idea of you're born, you educate yourself, you get a job, you get a pension and you die. And it's such an unsustainable way of looking at work. I think even everyone on this call or everyone on this panel can think about probably the amount of jobs and the amount of shifts they've had within their career and everyone constantly telling you that's not normal, that's not normal, you're meant to just like stay on this like path to death. <laughs> but I say this to more say when it comes to this conversation around how the manufacturing industry changes, I think it's more, of a, I think it's more natural. It's more natural in the idea of how, um, us as a society thinking about what are the things that other people can do outside of just being the, the sole thing you now must do is now get another job that is kind of still killing the world but in a, in a different industry and I think that's the conversation as a society we need to have like it's okay for people to have three or four different types of jobs within one week I'm sure a lot of people already do um, and so I think when it comes to those people who for instance are looking work in the manufacturing industry or anyone who works in the manufacturing industry I think we have this idea that people just do a job especially if they have that kind of kind of a hands-on type of job but actually it's giving people the freedom or creating a world um it's creating a world where people actually have a sense of freedom over their lives and over the way they work like 30 40 years ago people people or like you know my parents or grandparents generation they do a job it doesn't actually matter if you like the job you just do it and then that's it and I think we're living in a world where you can have those conversations. So I don't even necessarily think the conversation is, do they go from like solely from the arms trade to the green? It's more, what do we see as a society, as an individual's time and what they should be doing as a job? Um, so I know I answered the question in a more of a roundabout way, but I think it's just because I think of the concept of work that we currently live in as so wrong within itself. Um, whereas we should be thinking as humans and as societies constantly, okay, I might do this on a Monday and this, you know, helps society in this way, but on Friday I might be doing something different or maybe I take a four day week, like, do you know what I mean? So I just think, I just think that's the conversation to be had before we think about what people are doing. Yeah, definitely. I think we're all guilty of it. Like you've become so desensitized to what we are as human beings and so kind of trapped into this very binary view of the capitalist society that we live in and and people kind of just end up seeing themselves as this vehicle of labor that has to spend you know 40 45 hours a week working in a specific job and i i completely agree we need to be redefining the notion of what work is and what we should be expecting of ourselves because otherwise we are we are do, literally mirroring the actions of our oppressors and we're setting these kind of goals how we can marginally improve the, the the systems that we live within when we need to be ripping up the systems we know that the systems aren't broken they're working exactly how they were designed to 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 benefit um, and privilege a, a very few a small number of people so we need to challenge ourselves I agree constantly thinking bigger about what work is and not just seeing it within this very kind of narrow-minded neoliberal capitalist view of the world um, someone's asked a, an interesting question here around um, the clamp down from the recent Tory guidance on outlawing um, anti-capitalist materials I wanted to um, bring Annie in on this. I feel like you have some really interesting things to say. Um, so maybe we can kind of discuss um, why we think that the government are driving this uh, kind of clamp down um, further to the action that we've seen across the last year and how do we fight back against this? Well, I can't seem to turn my camera on. Oh, oh no worries. There we go. All right, um, thanks. Um, so I think that, um, so we've seen this kind of coming, right? Because the prevent strategy, um, though it talked about um, Islamic extremism, quote unquote, a lot of it was directed at preventing um, what was seen as radicalization. And so we have to understand that within the context of like a centrist consensus in which 
what are viewed as extreme political views, whether or not they're in service of justice or they're in service of fascism, as in the far right, they're both equally a threat to society. And so it's no surprise then that the attacks on anti-capitalist materials in, in um, education are coming alongside attacks on um, critical race theory. Now, I have critiques of critical race theory. I doubt they're the same as Kemi Badenoch. Um, and so I think that um, what we kind of have to understand is there were two routes that could have been taken in order to challenge some of the currents that we're seeing in society, particularly the kind of far right um, currents and the kind of drift towards authoritarianism. And one of those routes was to present it as an issue of um, uh, criminal justice, um, to present it as an issue of, as I mentioned, security, which is the route the government has taken. The other route, if you actually wanna tackle the root causes of terror, if you actually wanna tackle the root causes of social disenfranchisement, if you actually wanna tackle the root causes of poverty, is to provide people with a meaningful education, which connects them to that history, right? So what we're taught is a, a, single, um, a single kind of thread um, in which the West advances further and further along this moral arc as kind of the protagonist in this movie. But the reality is that the West has never ceded any kind of power without the struggles of ordinary people. And those ordinary people then get completely written out of the history. And the reason why that's dangerous, the reason why teaching young people about trade union struggles, the reason why teaching young people about the black power era, teaching young people about anti-colonial struggles is because that tells them that the, the, the state is not, does not have a monopoly on power and that people organized are able to change the state of affairs. And so it's completely clear to me why the government would do that. It's completely clear to me why, for example, higher education curriculums don't talk very much about radical politics. But I think that places so much more of an impetus on us who were able to um, uh, learn from the generation before us and able to find that information ourselves to then pass that on in a gracious way to the people who are just joining the movement. Yeah. Yeah, wow. I'm just processing everything you said. That was incredible. Um, so we've got um, like literally four minutes left. So we're just going to be wrapping up. I know the time's really, really flown by. There's so much that we've covered off today. Um, someone's asked a question, which I think is really important. I want to bring each of you in just for like 30 seconds to give a final summary. Um, tying together kind of the issues that we've talked about today. We know that these things are interdependent. We know that the issues are big and the systems are working exactly how they've designed um, them to. I want to look forward about where we go from here and how we find hope. Um, can each of you just give a really short summary of what, what gives you hope at the moment? So if we just start with Sham. I think what gives me hope at the moment, I'm sure everyone heard my nephew screaming outside, is seeing their cheering faces every day, making me understand that we have to fight for their futures. I think also the movement last year did culminate in so many more people becoming more radicalized. So of course we have our book club and seeing every month so much, so many more new faces joining us wanting to discuss, you know, radical socialist texts from black and brown revolutionaries. That's what gives me hope. Fantastic. Thank you. And Helen, what gives you hope and how do we build the movement moving forwards? I, I, I agree like a lot with what Sham said um, in a sense of like, um, you know, I think a lot of the time when we think of like social movements in the past, like, let's say, eight nine years or something you know we can think of like the me too movement we can think of blm and all these things and i think when you work in like a corporate setting it's this idea that oh that's happening but it's going to go away oh that's happening but it's finished you know what i mean it's just people on the street and they're going to go home but what we're seeing and i think it is a concept it's a good thing about social media and it is a good thing that we're online is that they're not going anywhere they go and they might they might slow down a bit don't don't get me wrong like momentum goes for a little bit but it comes back like look look at everyone constantly talking about this and like Sham said like more people are radicalized more people are say more people are educated even if you're not on the streets more people know about the issues no one could say that they don't understand right okay people can say they don't understand these things but they know it's happening and they can't ignore it in a way that I feel 
you know, when my mum talks about growing up in the UK, people could just kind of gaslight her and pretend that they don't know what she's talking about. Um, so that gives me hope. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, brilliant. And Annie, have you got any closing words on what's giving you hope and how we build the movement? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I kind of am a self-taught Marxist in a sense, and um, I get my hope from the unshaking belief in me that there is a human will to freedom. And so if we cut through all the mystifications of capitalist society, um, there's always gonna be this impulse. What else can explain um, in an era in which we're so disconnected from these histories, the proliferation of resistance at every point. Um, and so that gives me hope. What also gives me hope is the eagerness of people to learn and the humility of a lot of people who are providing this education, because I think that that's the starting block for a really strong and um, durable movement. Totally, that was that was really nice hearing you all with your all kind of positive